Hello everybody, thanks for having me. Uh, this is my first Hacklu, so I'm very glad to be here and I'm really glad to, to be in Luxembourg. Uh, this talk is Dredge, it's an open source tool that we developed to do incident response in the cloud uh, because of a specific problematic that we see every day in Argentina and in Latin America, but after talking with different uh, persons around, I, I understood that it's not something that is only happening in Latin America. So I think uh, it's something that could affect globally, especially to small and, and medium companies. Uh, as I told you, I'm from Argentina. I'm a cloud incident responder. If you don't know where Argentina is, it's right in the bottom of the, of the world. So it was a very long flight, uh, and I came alone, so please approach me, talk to me. If you have photo for me, I would trade that for beer. So also, I think it's a, it's a, it's a nice opportunity. Uh, so, well, why Dredge? Uh, this is how an incident response preparation plan should look like. Here you see that in order to do an incident response strategy, you first need to prepare. Uh, that's great if you do, but most companies don't. So they go directly to the detection and, and response part. Uh, so they start to enable tools like Suricata, Garduti, create detection rules. And then when they get alerts, they start to get filled with false positives, and that's very creepy. So they start to disable those alerts, and then they got hacked. Uh, but also what we see in Argentina is there is other problem that they don't even in enable detection rules. So they start their business, they focus in the time to market, they develop a new product, and then they are compromised and they don't have even logs to look like for the incident response. And we saw this like in small companies, in bigger companies, uh, and then it was really hard for us to do the response because when the company is not prepared, there is not lo logs to look like, there is no knowledge of the infrastructure, and most tools require a lot of time to be implemented, and they are not prepared for an incident response process. So it's like one thing is to implement, for example, a cloud security posture management when you are preparing for like a, for a, a future attack, and a different thing is when you are in the middle of attack and you need to start understanding what's going on in your cloud infrastructure. But it's not, that's not their fault, mostly because this is a chart that compares how much it costs for a company to implement something like a log collection tool. These are not like real values are estimated because the other problem with log collection tool is like you have a, a lot of different pricing models. There are a lot of memes around the world doing like, oh yes, I can buy this theme for this amount of money, and then there are a lot of hidden charges. I'm not going to mention any company in there, but there are a lot of those. Uh, so as you can see here, for example, this is for AWS. The green bar on the top is how much it costs for you to store the logs in AWS S3. And those are the different costs that different tooling can cost for you. And this is the difference when you start generating alerts from that. So as you can see, the cost increased really, really, really bad. And this is only for detection. Imagine when you, when you have to implement something like a cloud security posture management. The costs are much higher because these tools are like super trendy right now, there are a lot of competition, but not as much as well developed to, to implement. And the only f three or four or five competition competitors are like super, super expensive. So when a company says, okay, I need to implement my strategy in the cloud, they say, okay, I need a hundred K. I don't have a hundred K and the risk doesn't uh, worth to, in to invest a hundred K to do security right now. Let's do this in the future. And things happen. And that's only the technology part of the incident response process in the cloud. The other difficulty that we face is like when you train somebody in cloud security and then also you train them in incident response, suddenly it's like a person that, does it, that is like one in a million because there, those are super technical skills. And first, companies cannot afford to have them. 
and consultancy companies also cannot afford them because, especially in Latin America, it's super common that a, a, a company for, from Europe or from the US hire them first with a bigger salary and then we start over again. So for me, the reality is measured with memes. And if, if we have a lot of memes about SIM implementation and log collection and false positive, it's because we are doing something not as good. So what does Dredge do? Dredge basically what it does, it has four modules, log collection, threat hunting, incident response, uh, a cloud, uh, and a cloud status. Uh, if you want the slides, I can share you with you in the, in the, in the, after the talk. It's, they, they can, I can upload those to the repo. Dredge is free, it's open source. Uh, it's for you to download, it's for you to provide feedback, to contribute, to use it in the manner you want. Basically, it started as a lot of uh, scripts of mine that I was using in my normal instant response basis, and then I started to share with my team, and then we say, okay, let's package everything and free it to the world. Basically, log collection allows you to get logs from different sources, GitHub, Kubernetes, Docker, AWS, GCP, in a unified manner. We're going to see that in, a, in an example, but the main idea is to say, Python, Dredge, AWS, give me the logs. And you don't need to understand anything else. This is useful for us, and it's useful for our clients, because, for example, when I'm doing an incident response task, and the client cannot allow me access to their infrastructure, and they don't know how to get the logs, I can say, okay, run this, execute this command, give me the output, and I can do the investigation with that. And that allows us to, to solve a lot of time. This is nothing fancy. They are a lot of scripts using Boto3 and doing something related like Cape does for, for infrastructure, but for the cloud. The threat hunting model uses something like this, but allows us to query, for example, for specific keywords to get specific patterns. It's a little bit more complicated, but when I show you the demo at the end, you're going to see that it's really easy to implement. The incident response allows us to execute, execute those tasks that we know that we need to execute, but that are not trivial because every cloud provider has their, their different approach to do things. For example, uh, the demo that we're going to see in a couple of minutes is about how to is network isolate a server in AWS. Whenever you're in an incident, you say, okay, I need to, I, I know that this computer is compromised. I need to isolate it. Okay, how? Who owns what? Which part of the AWS networking services allows me to isolate? And even though, and especially, what if I want to add that server to a forensic network? What should I do? Those are the, the questions that Dredge allows you to solve uh, in a more easy way. And the cloud status is a cloud security posture management, but for incident responders. Instead of giving you a lot of information that you don't need, it would give you the data that you need uh, to achieve the response. For example, the time creation of the different assets that can be used as for persistence, for example, SSH keys or IAM users. So Dredge can be executed in two ways. The first one is with a config file. There is a typical problem when we are analyzing cloud security environments. It's like everything is cloud, right? So there suddenly they have 10 GitHub accounts, 100 AWS accounts, GCP, Azure, so what we did is like, okay, you can set all the credentials in your computer or whatever you want, and you can configure those credentials in, a, in, in this part of the file. Uh, sorry. You can configure the credentials in the later part of the file. And in the first part, you can set, for example, the time window. If you don't want to get all the logs from everywhere, you can specific, you can say, okay, I need this time frame. And this will allow you to get the logs in an easy way. You can also set different profiles, as, as I was saying, and it will allow you to leave it running, getting all the logs, and then having a one zipped file with all the results that you should need. Okay, 
Let's start with examples. Log retriever. This is a TTP that is really, really, really common. Uh, it's about data collection, right? Uh, data collection is used by attackers to get data or leak data based on the GitHub, uh, the GitHub content of a repo. And the difficulty with this is like, if you want to analyze this for, from the GitHub uh, management console in the web, you are not going to see the logs that you need because of how GitHub is configured. You need to interact that through API. The problem is that you need to be an enterprise user to interact that with an API. And not everybody knows that they need to be enterprise user to get the logs. And even though you are an enterprise user, you need to understand what's the API endpoint that you need, you need to query. And that's not also trivial, and it's not related with the documentation. So we fixed that for you. This is an example of how the logs look in the web interface. And we are going to do a demo on how to get the logs with Dredge, and also for you to see in action. What you're going to see there is like we are going to execute Dredge. We're going to say Python 3, Dredge, Log Retriever, GitHub. Le vamos a pasar el target, el token de GitHub for, for, for authentication against the GitHub repo. And we are going to specify the organization. And we're going to see here is a lot of JSON files of the different logs of, uh, that, that GitHub provides to us. We can also say, the different logs from the enterprise that are different logs from the same type of assets. These are the logs that are related to the different repos. And in the logs, we are going to see uh, things that we are, we are not able to see in the web console. As we, uh, what you can see there is like, in order to change the target, we change org for end, and we say the, diff the name of the enterprise, uh, this will, will do the trick. If we Analyze this further. For example, we can say, for example, different uh, uh, actions that we weren't seeing in the web console. For example, the invitation to a repository. Here, with this type of logs that you cannot see in the web console, you can see git clones, git fetch, everything related with the with the management with the, of the repo. Now I'm going to show you a demo of the cloud status. As I was telling you, there are different types of, different way of gaining persistence in a cloud environment, specifically with cloud providers like AWS, Azure, or GCP, that have like a, a lot of services. The most common one is like create another IAM user or create another access key. But you can use this like creating another EC2 instance or creating another SSH key, as I was telling you before. The thing with permissions is like, if a user has a, a wildcard in the permission, it means that they can do everything. You could tell who is using wildcards in permissions right now, especially with all that we have known about what happened. Well, everybody, because whenever you start to try to align the permissions to execute specific actions, you understand that APIs in the clouds are a mess. And suddenly you want to do one thing, but in order to achieve that thing, you need to have permissions to another thing that you weren't thinking about, and you end up using a wildcard, and we will fix that tomorrow. And that's super common, especially when you don't understand or you don't want to understand how the type of access work. For example, what you can see in the black box is a hard-coded credential in a workstation of of, an, of a DevOps uh, using AWS. Uh, this is like super common, especially when they are using users to execute CI/CD tasks. So whenever a user, when a, whenever attack get access to these credentials, they try to first enumerate and understand what's going on, and later to gain persistence by creating a user. That's why when I'm executing a closed security posture management to understand what's, what's going on, I want to say, like, creation date of the user, if they have MFA or they don't have MFA, if they are able 
to authenticate to the AWS console if it's a service account or if a user. In AWS, there is no difference. So if I have an IAM user that is meant to be a service account, a service account like, for example, the GitHub user or the Terraform user, and suddenly I, say, I see that it has console access and no MFA, that's a, re, a, a warning. And it's something that can allow us to understand a little bit more if we were compromised, specifically if we are in the middle of an incident, right? So we are going to see another demo. This is going to use the closed status module against AWS. I'm going to authenticate using a profile. And I'm going to say, give me the IAM users. So this is going to interact with the AWS console using Boto3. And it's going to present to me the IAM users with the information that I need a little bit. As you can see here, we can see we don't have a lot of data, but we have what we need. We have the username, if it has access keys or not, if the user has access to execute actions programmatically, if it has MFA enabled, if it has a console access, all the information that is tactical for me to understand what's going on in the middle of an incident. And this is what we need to, to understand what to tackle first. An example for an incident response is what I was telling you about execution on a, on a web server. If we have an EC2 instance that is a, a server running in AWS and it got compromised, we need to isolate it. There are a lot of TTPs that are related to that. Uh, and this is our example of how the dry arm should look like. So we have at, at my left the compromised instance, and at my right I have a EC2 box designed to be like the forensic box. And we have the red square around our security groups. And the gray, the gray square is the VPC that would be the LAN network and something that called network access control list. Permissions to interact at network level in AWS are given through security groups. But you cannot re block access through security groups. You need to use network access control list. The common mistake when you are doing incident response in the cloud is like you say, okay, I would remove the security group of the instance so they wouldn't have access anymore. And the, pro the first problem that you face is like you cannot remove this, the security group. You need to change it for a new one. So suddenly you need to create a new security group to change it in the instance so they have a security group without access. And after that, you think that you are protected, but the reality is no, because when you create a security group, a new security group, besides it has no permissions, the existing connections in the server are not closed. So if I have persistence in the server, I'm go not going to be kicked out besides changing the security group. So what I need to do is like to implement a network control access control list to block all the connections so I can clear that, specifically if I have no access to the server. The difficulty there is like a network access control list affects the whole network. So if our other service is running there, I could generate an out to the native of service. So I need to do something really quick that is change the security group, create a network access control list, and remove it so I can cut all the connections and make sure that that server is correctly isolated. So if I have to do that manually, it could take me five, 15 minutes. If I have to do that uh, with scripts, it's much faster. Let's see a demo. So what I'm going to use here is like, uh, I'm going to execute the cloud status model. Uh, I'm going to specify AWS. I'm going to authenticate again. As you can see here, it's the same thing as I did for the IAM users, but instead of that, I'm doing for EC2 instance. 
It's going to give me data from the EC2 instance. For example, it says that the metadata, uh, metadata value is one. It allows, it means that an attacker can get credentials from the server. Then I'm going to use the closed status uh, module to understand what's going on in the security group. What permissions does the security group have? So you can see that the security group can go out to the internet. So this server can go out to the internet. And then what I'm going to execute is the incident response command. The difficulty with this in response command is like they have, they should have admin permissions because they are going to execute things against the cloud. But what this uh, command that is like isolate instance is going to do is like, well, as I told you, it's going to create a new security group, it's going to replace the security group, it's going to create a network access control list to local connections, and it's going to restore the network access control list to the previous one to to, for us to get certain that we are not DOSing ourselves. Uh, I can, I can upload the demos to the repo also if you want. It's not an issue at all. So, and it's going to allow, to tell us that the, the status was okay. As you can see here, I'm executing again the cloud status feature to understand what's the new security group of the instance. As you can see, the new security group is the forensic security group that we just created without access to anywhere else. So, with one command, we can execute this response in an easy way, and we are certain that it's executed properly and not manually, and there are no errors. And if there is an error, we can do something uh, for that matter. Okay, the last module is threat hunting. With threat hunting, it's, a diff it's, it's, it's tricky because we need to understand what's we are, what is what we are going to hunt. This is not a tool designed to do uh, a strategic plan of a threat hunting exercise. It's not for, uh, it's not meant to be like your main tool for execute threat hunting against, against the cloud. But if you are executing a root cause analysis exercise, or if you're in the middle of an incident and you need something specific for a log, we can use this to get that data in a fast way. It's a combination of uh, we have different types of, of things that we can do with threat hunting. It, I, I created integrations with Shodan, with Huiz, and with VirusTotal, because are the tools that I use the most. So, for example, if I have uh, different IPs, or I have a file, or a big log, and I need to get IPs, I can run the tool against that big file. It's going to get all the IPs, and it's going to trigger that against VirusTotal, and it will, will, go in, will give me... a uh, different kinds of results based on, on what's going on. Also, what I can do is like run an IOC hunting against AWS so I can e execute the log retriever model to get the logs I want and with tools like grep or AWAK, I can get more data if I need it. So the command is the same. Dredge, but we are using log retriever in this way as we used to get the logs from GitHub. We are going to authenticate against AWS in the same way that we did with incident response and threat hunting. And we are going to specify, speci specify the event history log. And we are going to grab for a specific IP. The event history log are all the API calls that are executed against AWS. So. The old world is a big world because most of the, most of the API are documented and most of the API are logging, but AWS uh, does it things without that. But for the practical reasons and for a tactical perspective, you have all the API calls. We can also execute a query looking for public IPs, for example, to understand what's going on. We can debug, we can get all the public IPs to understand if there is something that is related with an IOC that we are tracking, we used that uh, two years ago to find like an attack that was related. We were able to, uh, to relate two lapsus attacks using this with, with the IOCs that we had for a previous incident. Uh, we can also grab for a user agent or an IAM user 
So if I want to see all the actions that were executed for me, for example, or if were executed from different, there is, there was a common example, for example, that there, there was an attacker that was using a tool that's called Stree Browser. It's like a web interface for you to interact with AWS in an easy way. And it has a specific user agent that we were able to find that using something like this. Another type of hunting exercise that we can do is like looking for actions, for specific actions. Uh, we are going to look for AWS persistence. This is what I was telling you about the IAM user. What are the ways that an at the attacker can get persistence where they can create a new search, they can create an access key, they can create an SSH key. So what we are going to do is like get all the API calls logs and we are going to do a worldly search with grep for those events that we know that are related to bad behavior. We can add other types of attacks, we can do, for example, more sophisticated types of persistence, like trying to poison a Kubernetes cluster or, or trying to get access to, uh, to a different, for an ECR repo or, or whatever. Uh, if we know what are the API calls that are related to those TTPs, we can search that in this way. Uh, and the last example is uh, how an attacker would uh, impair defenses. We have built-in defenses in AWS. We have defense that we can enable, for example, AWS Garduti, that is a tool to do security detection. We can enable CloudTrail, that is a way to ship all these logs to a SIM, for example, and we can get from this way if an attacker disables our logs. It's common that if an attacker gets compromi compromised or tenant, the first thing they, add, they do is like disable cloud trail logging. So we cannot know what's going on. But this event history log is enabled by default and always and, and stores data for three months. So if we understand later that we were compromised, we can search in here for what was done. So this is the last demo. This is something exactly like that. We are using Dredge, Log Retriever, Authentication, AWS. But the different thing is that we are going to use a different keyword. We can, as this is a script, we can automate it in like wrapping this to do the queries that you want. You can use word list with the critical asset. For example, if you know that different user are admin user, if you know that different servers are critical servers, you can. So we, here what we are seeing is like it found Choose stop logging and you the let det detector. The stop logging means that the attacker was able to disable our cloud trail environment and the delete detector means that they disable all security detection implementation in, in AWS. So, yeah, that would be it. Uh, again, Dredge is free, it's open source, it's for you to download. Again, it's not nothing fancy, it's not AI, it's not powered by nothing, it's a bunch of scripts that I find really useful, and I think that in environments like Argentina, uh, help a lot to companies that cannot afford to have a proper security implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Santi. <laughs> On this note, if anyone here does cloud like Santi does, there is a cloud SOC a knowledge sharing group run by Julie Agnes Sparks, who works for Datadog. There's also a cloud security Slack with uh, more than 30,000 people from all over the world, including probably all the APTs, part of that Slack. So if, if you're interested in joining those, you can just reach out. Um, does anyone have questions? Because I have questions. Anyone else? Thank you. Really exciting, uh, exciting work you've been doing. I was wondering. I mean, you showed quite some some interesting features and so on. Uh, 
for me it's quite new. So I'm wondering which uh, type of features are you really missing now? And either you're planning to do to add yourself or hoping other people might add it for you. Well, thank you for your question. Yeah, I, I, I implemented a lot of stuff. I, I show you three or four, but there are like 20. If you go to a repo, you can see a lot more. But yeah, I need to, uh, for example, I have a log retriever for GCP, but I don't have the incident response part for GCP or the cloud status part for GCP. The same happened with Azure or with GitHub. There is a lot of things to do. I would, I would like to have a MISP integration, for example, to check for IOCs. I would like to be able to ship notifications to a CRM like Shira. There are a lot of work to do, and it's open. So whoever wants to contribute to help, or uh, if if you want to for me to explain this in a, uh, further, I would be more than happy. Uh, but yes, there is a lot of things to do, and we are con we are progressively adding things. But it, it takes a lot of time, you know. But But yeah, the, the idea is to make it bigger because uh, back in my country is being used and it's, 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 it's useful for, for those companies. And I think Dredge might be the biggest, but there is at least three and probably four or five other open source cloud incident response frameworks out there. So we're actually suffering right now from having too many tools with different and in some cases overlapping capabilities. So some kind of... a Consolidation here would probably be an advantage. Even my yeah. team released a tool open source that does, for example, ECE2 instance capture for forensics and moves it to a forensics account uh, okay. uh, two or three years ago. And the, uh, do, you, do you do the capture and the response or the forensic capture of the EBS volume? Same, different capabilities built into one tool. Okay. This one has that as an example, one capability, but also definitely many others. So. No, no, of course, of course. And I, I think that the... Anyone else questions? So I don't start talking. If not, thanks Santi, that was great, thank you. Thank you.